Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jin Xi. I'm a final year student from the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And I was introduced to the world of Ruby and Rails about slightly more than a year ago. So by way of a very short self-introduction, this is my exceedingly silly GitHub handle. And this may or may not be my typical facial expression IRL. <laughs> so my talk today is called All I Wanted to Know About Ruby's Object Model Starting Out and more. But before I dive into the topic proper, I want to talk a little bit about the motivations behind this. So you know, why this topic and why this talk? Well, if you ask me why this talk, the first thing I'm going to say to you is, free RDRC tickets, yay! <laughs> but of course, I also want to approach this more as a, you know, as a beginner who still has a lot to learn about programming and the language and software development in general. So the question that I have is, what is it like to be a beginner learning Ruby? So in the beginning, everything is lovely and beautiful, right? The language is clean, clutter-free, expressive, sometimes even reads just like English. Blocks, procs, enumerators, and lambdas, slightly strange, but you get the hang of it after a while. And the basic object-oriented paradigm isn't too hard to pick up, so pretty soon you're writing your own classes, subclassing them, mixing in modules. And so you are in love. But if you hang around with Ruby long enough, you start to see fun stuff like this. And this, and you hear people talking about singleton methods, meta classes, mixing and mod extending modules instead of including them, and so on and so forth, and a lot of head scratching and confusion ensues. And maybe you keep reading and rereading Ruby docs and various blog posts, but you still can't quite you know, remember the difference between class eval and instance eval, or you still keep wondering what's, what does that self dot included hook does down there, or why it's even necessary, right? And so you begin to realize that you should be able to do better. You should be able to build a mental model that has the power of unifying all these seemingly disparate bits of Ruby. And so that's what I set out to do. And that is basically all I wanted to know about Ruby's object model starting out. But because I also have completionist tendencies, I decided to poke around the CRuby source code itself, and that is where the more comes in. So without further ado, here's all I wanted to know about Ruby's object model starting out as a story. In the beginning, there was chaos. But soon, from that primordial soup of procedural code that sprung forth, type defs and macros, and these gradually coalesced into the finest of all rubies. And Ruby said, let us make objects, but not in our image nor our likeness, for I am a jealous ruby, and I want to be the shiniest ruby there is. And so was Rot, the plainest of all objects. Basic object. And basic object, new kernel. And unto them was conceived and born object. And object begot module, and module begot class. <laughs> now, Ruby had given her creations dominion across the land. And so object set forth and begot many other classes, whose multitudes of concrete instances soon spread across the code of the very many Ruby programmers of the world. And so this was the world that all the objects knew, and it was great and happy. But Ruby had also furnished her creations with a very special kind of power, which was soon to precipitate a great existential crisis. This was the power of introspection. And so it was that one of the first objects, Doge, began to ask, what am I? And he discovered that he could call the method class, and the answer was as plain as day. He was a dog. And so the existential crisis passed. Now Doge was happy, but as would have it, dog now had a problem. He asked the same question, what am I? And so he called the method class and discovered that what he was was a class. And he discovered he could also call the method superclass and remembered that his parent was none other than object. And so Dog knew what he was and where he came from, and so he was content. Yet this was not the end. Soon even the most ancient of objects began questioning their own existence. Basic object, object, module, class. All of them asked, what am I? And it turned out that all of them were classes. 
and they remembered whom had begot whom. Colonel asked herself the same question and discovered that she was a module and remembered that she had no parent to speak of. And so this was the world that all the objects knew, and some of them thought the arrows were getting a little bit messed up, but they lived with it. <laughs> Alas, the first wave of the existential crisis was now over. But soon enough, Doge began agonizing again. He complained to Dog. You say that as a dog, I should be able to bark and wag my tail and be stroked on my belly and so forth. I know I'm different from the other dog instances. I weigh different and so on, but truly, I want more individuality than that. Not just, I want the means and the methods to manifest my singly doge nature. Not just to bark, but to go so doge and such wow. <laughs> and dog looked at him and shook his head, for he knew not what he could do. But in the night, Doge was visited by Ruby herself, who was full of sympathy for the poor animal. And so she spoke, Thusly, I do grant you the power to be the Doge that you want to be. No longer shall you be a dog, but you shall be a singleton Doge. Yet to keep the peace, I cannot make this obvious, for if I do, dog will be jealous. And so was created a new class, the singleton class of Doge. But it was such that if Doge called the method class, he knew himself still as a dog. It was only if he called the method singleton class that he knew where his uniquely Doge abilities came from. Only Ruby knew that deep in the primordial chaos, Doge's true class was actually his singleton class. Now Doge was happy, but of course, Dog now had a problem. He complained to Ruby, the programmers want me to keep track of all my dog instances and find them by their name. I can't do that with normal instance methods. I need class methods. And Ruby, remembering what she had granted Doge, saw a similar solution over here. And so she spoke, thusly, I do grant you the power to have methods of your own and not methods that all class objects possess. And so Ruby created a singleton class of dog. And because dog himself was a class, this singleton class was like a class of a class, and Ruby christened it a meta class to distinguish it from the normal singleton classes of ordinary instance objects like Doge. But in creating the dog singleton class, Ruby now had to create the class meta class, and the module meta class, and the object meta class, and the basic object meta class. And she made it such that the original genealogy was mirrored, so it was as if the basic object meta class had begot the object meta class, and the object meta class had begot the module meta class, and so on. And because we like arrows, so she made it as if class had begot the basic object meta class. <laughs> so now the objects and the classes, they were finally happy, but now their world had been very much complicated. And every so often, one of these meta classes was want to cause mischief, demanding that they have their own meta class. And these meta meta classes would be even more mischievous, demanding that they have their own meta class. And on and on would these meta 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 classes go until no one could see the end of the whole damn thing and all the ordinary objects and classes just rolled their eyes and went on with their day to day, oblivious to all this meta madness. And so with that, I've come to the end of my Ruby creation myth. So hopefully that was able to give you a sort of grand schematic overview of Ruby's object model in a fun way. And with that, dun, 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 it is time for more. It is time to retell the Ruby creation myth through the lens of C Ruby source. So as they say in Ruby, all data is represented as an object. So Doge is an object, and dog, which is a class, is also an object. And what this translates to in the C Ruby source is that all our objects are represented as pointers to structs. So you have this pointer, this arrow over here, pointing to a, va a value and a memory address. In this case, a value is a struct, which is just a bag of attributes. I also call them members. Now the question, of course, is what is actually in this struct? And this is the point where I'm going to show you some actual C Ruby code. Just to note, this is from the 2.4 branch. So there'll be three structs we're primarily interested in. The first is the struct used to represent ordinary instance objects, our object. Second is the struct used to represent class objects, our class. 
And finally, you'll realize that both of these structs actually store a third struct, rbasic. So let's take a look at rbasic. This is the struct that stores information that is basic to all objects, right? So first, we have a flags member, which, is, which basically stores metadata of the object. So whether or not this is an instance object, or a class object, or a module object, all this is stored in flags. And also whether or not this is a singleton class, that is also stored in flags. Secondly, and very importantly, we have this class with the K member. So this is actually a reference to the class of our object, right? So it points to an R class struct. And if you look at our object, it's, well, it's just R basic plus stuff. It's plus R basic plus this union thing over here, which suffice to say is for storing instance variables. And finally, our class. Again, we have R basic, so it also has flags and class. But importantly, we also have this super member which is a reference to the superclass of this class, so it also points to an R class struct. And then we have this pointer to this something called a Ruby class extension struct, which we won't worry about, but I should mention that since class objects are also instance objects, they also can have their instance variables, and these class instance variables are actually stored in this class extension struct. Finally, we have a pointer to the method table, so this is where all the instance methods are stored, and this is the table that's looked up during method dispatch. So if we talk about method dispatch, this is the core you know, logic right here, right, in this search method function. Basically, look up the method table of my class, and if I can't find anything, just go up my inheritance chain, go up my super chain, and keep looking up the method tables until we find a method with a matching name. So if I call the, the class method on Doge, this will be the chain of our class structs whose method tables we will be looking up, except not quite, there's a slight complication here from kernel, which you realize is not a superclass of object, it's just a module that's mixed into objects. Yet somehow it manages to find its way into this super chain over here. And we'll see more clearly how that happens when we talk about modules later on. So with that, we have laid the basic groundwork. We've seen how Ruby actually represents our data as, as pointers to structs. Now the question is, where does it all begin? Where does our Ruby creation myth actually start? And the answer is in this giant function in object.c called init vm object. And at the very top, you realize it's calling init class hierarchy. Now, this is the function where our class hierarchy actually gets bootstrapped, right? So after all these boot def class function calls, our hierarchy goes like this. And all these R basic set class macro calls are basically setting the class pointer of basic object, object, module, and class to point to class. And at this point, maybe you're like, where is kernel? Well, if you go back to init vm object, which is a really gigantic function, but somewhere in there, we are initializing kernel and including it in object. And so at the end of all this, your diagram looks something like this, pretty much what we saw from the creation myth just now. In addition to basic object, object, module, and class, and kernel, Ruby also initializes all the built-in classes, such as nil, string, array, true class, and so forth, all in init vm object. So we're happy with that, but now the next interesting question is, what happens when I actually define my own class? So say I want to define a class dog. A key function that gets called is rbDefineClassID. And this basically does three things. The first is, if we don't specify our explicit super, we set the default super to object, which you all know, right? Second, we actually create the new class, so we initialize a new R class struct with the given super. And this also sets the class pointer of this R class struct to point to class with a capital C. And finally, we actually make and set the meta class of this class straight away. So before we talk about meta classes and all, our diagram looks like this. It's pretty simple, right? We just created a new class, dog, we set a super, we set its class pointer. Okay, but this is before meta classes. And before I want to talk about meta class creation, I guess I should you know, clarify the terminology a bit, because I guess this is always a point of confusion for beginners, and as it was for me. Basically, a singleton class is synonymous with eigen class, and a meta class is a kind of singleton class, but specifically, it is a singleton class of a class object. So we, we speak of the meta class of dog, but the singleton class of doge. And since meta classes are also classes, you can have meta classes of meta classes. So meta meta classes, meta 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 classes, in general, meta to the n classes. Although you'll be like, 
well, well, pretty much any n greater than 1 is practically useless, right? But it's pretty fun to know that Ruby actually allows you to do this. And so with that, let us talk about meta-class creation. Boromir knows well that one does not simply make a meta-class. And indeed, if you look at the make meta-class function, it is not easy to digest. <laughs> but again, it does basically three things, okay? First, we actually initialize our new meta-class. So we initialize the new R-class struct. Second, we set the class pointer of our class, so the class pointer of dog, we set the class pointer of that to point to our new meta-class. But we also have to set the class pointer of our new meta-class to point to something. And finally, we set the super pointer of our new meta-class to point to, again, something. So, before we actually start setting the class pointer of our new meta-class, right, our diagram looks like this. Again, it looks pretty simple. We have just created a new meta-class of dog, but you notice that that class pointer, it has to go somewhere, right? So, how do we set the class pointer? If you look at the logic of the function, you notice that we end up calling this funny and sure eigen class macro. And at the end of the day, what this macro does is return the meta class of class. So in other words, the superclass of dog's meta class is class's meta class. And if class's meta class hasn't already been created, we have to make it, right? So let's go and make the meta class of class. Then, same thing, we initialize the meta class of class. And now we meet the same problem. We have to set the class pointer of the meta class of class. But how do we resolve it in this case? Well, it turns out that for the meta class of class, its class pointer just points back to itself. And so our diagram looks something like this. So we're happy with the class pointer. But now you notice you have another problem. What about the super? Well, if you look at how the super is set, you realize again we are calling this ensure eigen class macro. And the logic of this line is that the super class of dog's meta class is the meta class of dog's super class. Or in other words, the meta class of module. So you see that we're setting off this whole chain reaction. We have to make the meta class of module. And now we have to set the super of the meta class of module. So by the same logic, the super of the meta class of module should be the meta class of object. And the super of the meta class of object should be the meta class of basic object. And now we have reached the end of the chain. So what should the super of basic, the meta class of basic object be? Well, it turns out that it's just class. And you notice that we actually haven't finished creating our dog meta class. We still have to set its super pointer. So finally, after creating all those meta classes, we can come back and set the super pointer of our dog meta class. And the logic's the same, right? The super class of dog's meta class is the meta class of dog's super class. And so it's the meta class of object. So congratulations, we are done, right? All we wanted to do was create a single dog class, but we end up spawning like five different classes and a gazillion arrows along the way. So indeed, Boromir was right. And maybe at this point, you're like, oh, this meta class stuff's insane. But fret not, because compared to that, making normal singleton classes is the proverbial walk in the park. And it is evidenced by how short this function is. So again, it does basically three things. First, we actually initialize the R class struct, the new singleton class. And importantly, we set the super of this new singleton class to point to the original class of our instance object. So the original class of Doge was dog, so we set the super of Doge's singleton class to point to dog. And then we actually set the class pointer of Doge to point to this new singleton class. And finally, we set the class pointer of our new singleton class to point to the meta class of class. And so at the end of all this, you have something like that. It's pretty much where our creation myth left off. So at this point, you will realize that we are still missing a pretty big part of Ruby's object model, which is modules. So how does including modules actually work? And the answer is that Ruby finds a pretty clever way of sneaking modules into our inheritance chain with something called include classes. So let's take a look at how that works. I want to give, I want to give Doge some saber teeth. Okay. So I include the saber teeth module in the dog class. What happens when I do this is that Ruby creates a special kind of class called an include class and inserts it to our inheritance chain just like so. And the special thing about this include class is that it actually shares the same method table as our module. 
And in this way, method dispatch just works like normal, right? We just go up the inheritance chain. So this is where the bulk of the module inclusion logic can be found. Uh, this include modules add function, which honestly speaking is a really hefty function. I'm not even sure if I completely understand it at this point yet. But this is the key part where we're actually creating our new sing, uh, include class and inserting it into the inheritance chain with this R class set super macro. And I should mention that since include classes and modules, they are just R class structs, right, internally. And R class structs, they have a class pointer. So what, what should a class pointer be set to? Well, for modules, we know the class pointer is set to module with a capital M. So the class of the saber teeth module is module. But it turns out that the class of the saber teeth include class, as you can see here, is actually the module itself. And so the class pointer is how our include class keeps track of the module it was created from. So if you include multiple modules in a class, so instead of just you know, saber teeth, I want to give Doge some sunglasses, because it's cool, right? So if I do that, because the include module set function is called every time uh, uh, include statement is evaluated, by the logic of how the include class is inserted into the inheritance chain, the module that's included later is basically has its include class inserted lower down the chain. Or in other words, we look up its method table first. So let us now complicate things a bit. Let us talk about including modules in modules. Now, at this point, I should emphasize again that modules and include classes are just R class structs. And other than the class pointer, R class structs also have a super pointer, right? And maybe at this point, you're like, but can modules have a super? And the answer is yes, but not by default. By default, the super is just null. But the super comes in handy when we want to include modules in modules. So let's take a look at how that works. Instead of giving Doge saber teeth and sunglasses, I want to give him a pair of saber teeth sunglasses. How cool is that? Right, so first, I include the saber teeth module in the sunglasses module, and then I finally include the sunglasses module in my dog class. What happens when I include a module in a module is really not too different from what happens when I include a module in a class. Basically, I create an include class of the included module, and I set the super pointer of the module I'm including that module in to point to the include class. Right, so now the super pointer of the sunglasses module points to the saber teeth include class. And finally, when I actually include the sunglasses module in dog, I just get two include classes inserted into the inheritance chain just like this. All right, so awesome, I've covered a lot of ground. I've talked about how classes and objects are actually represented in Ruby, how singleton classes and meta classes are actually created, and how modules actually work. Like how including modules actually work and extending modules isn't much more than either. So before I wrap up, I would be remiss not to mention, you know, just to clarify, the distinction between the C class and super pointers and the Ruby class and super class methods. So why do they seem to give different results? When the answer is, well, pretty simply that Ruby's class method, it does follow the class pointer in the C struct, but it just ignores singleton classes and include classes along the way. And so the class of the dog, uh, the dog singleton class is still class, right? And Ruby's super class method, it also follows the super pointer of the C struct, but it just ignores include classes along the way. And so even though the super of our dot class here is actually the saber teeth include class, its super class is still object. So maybe at this point you're like, ah, yeah, all this under the hood internal stuff, it is fun to know, but why? I mean, like, this is not going to make me a better Ruby programmer in my day-to-day -day or anything, right? right? And yeah, I guess, you know, to a certain extent, I agree. I know it's not particularly helpful to know that I can create meta, 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 meta classes. But I like to think that under having a solid understanding of Ruby's object model does help you reason about your code better, more clearly. And if in the future you ever meet, you know, potentially confusing situations, such as all of this, I mean, there's no need for me to even talk about it. Not just because I'm running out of time, but mainly, mostly because you now have the mental model to figure out all by yourself. The mental model that I wish I had starting out. And more. So, thank you. Okay. Any questions?
Don't lie. <laughs> no one has questions? Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh hi. <laughs> uh, first off, that was amazing. That was an amazing presentation. It was Thank great. you. Uh, my question is, how did you learn all this stuff? Or did you just read through the C files? Or well, yeah, so I think like around last year, I, f I saw this book, Ruby Under the Microscope. And actually, I, I kind of looked through the first few pages, and I was like, ah, why am I, learning, why am I reading this? <laughs> and put it aside. And after a while, I decided to, OK, maybe I should, you know, it's fun to know about this internal stuff. So I decided to poke around the Siri resource. But of course, as a beginner, it's like, how do I understand all of this? And then I found this really good resource called the Ruby Hacking Guide, by, uh, I think, uh, by, written by Aoki Minoru. It is actually for Ruby 1.8, but I mean the internals, the base, the core of Ruby hasn't really changed all that much. Mainly, it's the, the VM they've wrote, written a new VM, right, and all that. So it was still really helpful for me in understanding how you know the C Ruby code is laid out. So if you're interested in checking that out, definitely look at uh, look up the Ruby hacking guide. Yeah. Thank you. So Aaron kind of stole half of my question. But um, so when you started out researching this, did you expect to get that far down the rabbit hole, or like did you actually set out to find out all of that, like all the way, or did it just happen and you started looking and it was like, damn, like where does that lead? And it lead? well, it led like, to all of this. All this so mess. the initial ambition was, let me just try to give a talk at RDRC. Hmm, what topic can I talk about? And as a, as a beginner, I'm not even a professional, so I, don't have, I can't talk about my project. I don't really have projects to talk about and everything. So I'm like, oh, OK, I mean, let me dig into some Ruby stuff. And so yeah, it kind of just like, yeah, let me try to. Because the object, Ruby's object model is, is pretty fun, right? When I realized that there's this whole infinite, you know, infinite meta class thing going on, I was like, yeah, let me poke more into that. And then, yeah, like, like you said, I just poked into it, poked around, and it just ended up, wow, like, this is all the stuff that goes on. And just so that escalated up. quickly. Yeah. <laughs> cool, thank you. Thank you. Hey, once you learned all this stuff, did it change the way that you now write Ruby code? Like understanding it, does it, did you, I don't know, start using modules more often? Did you start extending included modules, etc.? I mean, definitely, I guess I will understand a lot of meta programming stuff better now. Because, I mean, all this, like, a lot of people use, like, um, I don't know, like class, class, method, uh, class method module, and then they have a self dot included hook, and I'm like, what? What's all this do? So definitely, that helps me understand this more confusing metaprogramming stuff uh, now. But you mean know, confession is that I haven't actually done Ruby for quite a bit <laughs> because I don't actually use it for work or in school. Yeah. So. How did you find out about the meta, meta, meta stuff? Did you read that in some book or in the C code, or did you use like puts and overrode like inherited or something like that? Well, actually, it's in uh, Ruby docs itself. So if you look at the class documentation, there's a you know there's a Reading diagram at the top with the, with the class with the class hierarchy, and then there, there's a chain of dashes off into infinity. So that's when I knew something sneaky was yeah, going on. Yeah, I saw on. that for like years ago, and I never understood why they're like, what, what does it mean, like just dot, dot, dot. Right. <laughs> well, now you know. OK, thank you. Any other questions? No? OK, thank you very much, Jinchi. Let's have another round of applause.